Hello! I didn't understand a word from the video, but I guess they're giving away a Google Home Mini. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rats, and today I'll be talking about modern Android development. The organizers told me uh, the audience may not recognize me if I don't put the hat. So here is the hat. <laughs> cool. Uh, before we start, um, what does really modern Android mean? Uh, probably to understand it, we need to talk about a little about uh, classic Android development and uh, what were the milestones, what was uh, part of classic uh, Android development. Uh, to go with that, uh, let's see some history. So first, uh, Android SDK, uh, which is called M3, uh, stands for Milestone 3, uh, was released in 2007. And at the time, it was using Java programming language. Uh, with, uh, it was released with a lot of platform APIs. Uh, the development uh, was done on Eclipse and a, a suite of plugins, which was called Android Development Tools. And when you're done, uh, your app was packaged as an APK, which was actually a simple zip file. Uh, the later uh, 1.0 released in 2008, and uh, at that time, uh, in the early years of Android, uh, platform releases mostly meant uh, more API, more platform APIs. So uh, that was uh, one uh, 1.0 was uh, releasing uh, for uh, released for more APIs. In uh, mid-2013, uh, we released Android Studio, which kind of deprecated Eclipse. And in 2007, uh, Kotlin support is released. Uh, another important thing happened in 2017 was architectural components. Uh, with architectural components, finally, we have become more opinionated on how you should build your Android app. <coughs> In 2019, uh, app bundles uh, uh, released. Uh, let's see all those in uh, a bit more detail. And first, of course, the language. Uh, it was a very good decision to start with Java programming language because it had a very large developer uh, base. Um, people were very familiar with uh, the tools in Java ecosystem. And most of those tools are were uh, free. Uh, again, Java programming language had a huge developer base, which meant it had a lot of libraries, open source projects, uh, patterns, best practices, tutorials, and stuff. And also compared to other languages, uh, it had its own memory management. So it was way easier and safer to write code and apps with Java. Uh, let's take a look at tools. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the time, uh, Android developer tools was a uh, plugin suite added on Eclipse. And the best part of it was Eclipse was free and ADT was free. So everything was simply free. Uh, Eclipse uh, was probably the de facto development uh, platform for uh, most Java developers. Um, uh, it's still widely used. Uh, so Eclipse provided a familiar developer experience for Android developers. And once again, everything was free. I guess that's the best part. So we should, uh, uh, encourage, uh, we should talk about this. Um, uh, also, the integration uh, of the uh, new sub-tools uh, into IDE was uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, next, the platform APIs. Uh, so all the new platform APIs were released with the platform. And uh, in the beginning, the uh, releases were very frequent. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a time graph, and you will see it was uh, we were releasing like two Android versions every year. Um, the, um, which, with every release, there were new platform APIs and new functionality. So that 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 was the reason why the releases were so frequent. And of course, uh, with such a pace, uh, 
we also introduced lots of bugs. And of course, we also fixed lots of them. So if you look at the time graph, which I mentioned about, the uh, Android 1.0 uh, came uh, close to the end of 2008. 1.1 uh, 1 .1, uh, is released in 2009. 1.5 uh, in uh, early 2009, uh, 1.6 late 2009, and uh, 2.0 released uh, again, uh, very late 2010. So you can see almost one year, there were four platform releases. And in 2002, we had version 2.2, uh, followed with 2.3. 2011, we see uh, Honeycomb 3.0. And with that, we started uh, uh, making releases a little slower, and you will see with 4.4, things have become, except with 4.1, things have become more stable and uh, the release cadence has become a new version every year. So we uh, come to Android 10 and finally 11 in 2020. So let's take a look at the other topic, distribution. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, Basically, uh, all we offered was APKs. So if you have an app, uh, we basically zip everything in your app, uh, which the uh, platform needs to run your app, and zip them together. Uh, basically, you can, uh, uh, you can think about APKs as a zip or tar file or jar file. Uh, but what if you had more configurations? Well, you ended up with two options. Either you create uh, different APKs for different configurations and upload them individually to uh, App Store, or create a uber large APK, which consists everything. So once a user downloads that APK, uh, they have all the options, uh, which might, uh, they, which their device might need. So these classical uh, approaches had introduced some classical problems. Uh, first, the language, uh, Java program, programming language was widely used and loved, but it also had its own uh, difficulties. Um, the new language features, uh, modern language features were moving slow and we were not able to offer a uh, more verbose uh, language. On the tool side, Eclipse and ADT uh, was difficult to customize and um, different sub-tools had inconsistent UIs, so it didn't offer a very good uh, user experience for the developers. Also, um, the, we were not in, uh, involved in the core ID do, IDE development, so we didn't get everything we needed for uh, moving Android tools forward. So let's take a look at the uh, previous APIs. Uh, previously, uh, the new APIs and functionality was bundled with the platform. Uh, so uh, that means developers are limited by users getting updates on their devices. Uh, that was really difficult to adopt new APIs and platforms uh, because somewhere in the world, you know, uh, someone uh, will be trying to use your app uh, in an old device which was waiting a new uh, operating system update. And also, uh, they were complicated. Uh, if you take a look at the, how things are designed, it made sense at the time, but uh, suddenly the life cycle, uh, for example, has become very complicated. And uh, it's not only the life cycle of an activity, you, you also need to consider how fragments work, which made the life cycle graph a huge thing. And finally, uh, distribution. Well, uh, you can... Uh, probably guess, but uh, building a huge monolithic APA to handle all uh, cases um, also meant a huge APK to download, which means uh, it, it will hold a lot of space on the user phone. 
and will eat up uh, their bandwidth. Also, uh, if you prefer to upload uh, many APKs, uh, it was a very complicated process and you need to manage it manually. With those, let's move to the final answer, the modern Android development. So modern Android development, uh, is basically I'll read the slide, uh, development tools, APIs, language, and distribution technologies recommended by the Android team to help you developers to be productive and create better apps that run uh, across billions of devices. So modern Android development is built on four main pillars. Uh, it's language, uh, sorry, language, tools, APIs, and the distribution. Let's start with the first one, language and Kotlin. So if we take a look at the Kotlin timeline, uh, Kotlin 1.0 is released in 2016. Uh, in 2017 at Google I.O., we announced Kotlin as officially supported language for Android. In 2009, again at Google I.O., we uh, announced uh, Android, Android goes Kotlin first which meant we'll do everything with Kotlin and uh, we'll uh, uh, release things for Kotlin first. And with 2020, uh, coroutines has become the preferred way to do async uh, jobs and uh, executions. And you are here, so uh, you're kind of responsible and uh, need to use everything I've talked uh, so far. Uh, but why did we choose Kotlin? Um, first, um, it offered very uh, uh, much less uh, boilerplate than Java. Uh, you could easily um, create stuff without writing uh, that much code, such as not writing getters and setters, so not maintaining them too, uh, or creating a singleton with just an object keyword and so. Um, next, uh, safety. Uh, when I say safety, I was, I, I'm basically talking about nullability. Uh, Java has uh, null for each type, but Kotlin doesn't have null as uh, default uh, for any type which means uh, you don't need to do null checks when you pass arguments or receive a new argument. Um, so the uh, support for nullability at language level uh, was a huge safety feature. Next, uh, probably the most important, uh, well, maybe not important, but most helpful thing, interoperability. So if we choose to go with a language which was not compatible with Java, that would mean you would throw away all the code uh, old code base and write everything from scratch. But Kotlin offered interoperability, which meant you could just write a Kotlin class inside your huge Java code base and everything will work together. Uh, you can call Kotlin from Java or do the other way. So interoperability really helped people to start using Kotlin and uh, uh, migrate to it. And finally, structured concurrency. Uh, Kotlin offered uh, uh, elegant asynchronous programming way, uh, which uh, helped us avoid uh, callbacks, spaghettis. So let's see those in code. Uh, First, as I mentioned, uh, um, if a property a variable can be null, uh, uh, you need to specially mark that variable so that uh, the user uh, will know, the user code will know, okay, this uh, property can be null, so I need to do uh, checks or stuff. But other than that, it's guaranteed that a, a property will not be null. Uh, the, uh, Kotlin has support for lambdas, which really help writing uh, callbacks, click listeners, and stuff. Oh, this, this used to be a very pain <laughs> thing to uh, do. Uh, uh, Kotlin supports extension functions, which is a very interesting feature. Uh, with extension functions, we can easily add uh, uh, new uh, 
methods or uh, capabilities to existing APIs without breaking the current users. Uh, this was a very hard thing to do with Java because uh, it didn't have such a mechanism. And if you take a look at how ex extension functions work, it's actually something really simple. Kotlin basically generates all the necessary code. But for your users and you, uh, calling an extension function just feels like calling a method on a class. Um, template expressions is, again, another feature which uh, we were lacking in Java, and uh, Kotlin uh, helps us to use those to uh, format and uh, build nicely uh, strings. And finally, uh, property access, uh, which basically use getters and setters in the background, helps you to, again, write less code without any boilerplate and just use the uh, property as you would expect. So uh, if we uh, look at uh, why we choose Kotlin, we see speed. It's not only, it's not about runtime speed, but it's about the speed of the evolution of the language. Uh, Kotlin is constantly uh, moving, and the language is uh, the language and the runtime library is improved. Uh, for example, uh, coroutines was experimental last year, and now it's fully supported. Um, similarly, um, extension with extension functions, we can add new functionality to existing APIs and uh, give you uh, new stuff. So. Uh, if we take a look at some numbers, 60% uh, of professional Android developers use Kotlin. 70% uh, of top 1,000 apps contain Kotlin code, which looks really good. And uh, if we take a look at uh, Google site, we are heavily investing into tooling with lint checks, and we have a dedicated compiler team which works uh, optimizing R8 uh, to build better code. Uh, also, um, uh, uh, working on speeding the annotation processor and so on. Um, also, with the um, annotate, uh, with the uh, we annotate the platform APIs with recently nullable, recently non-null, and nullable and non-null. Uh, this is because the platform APIs in uh, Android is written with Java. Uh, which means if you call a platform API, um, you will be, uh, you might be receiving a null object or a, a object with some value. So with these annotations, we can annotate the APIs and tell you if you 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 are expecting a null null value or not. And uh, the difference between recently and uh, nullable annotations are. Uh, recently gives you a warning if um, there's a chance you will get a null value. Uh, on the other hand, the nullable annotation will uh, break uh, your code. Um, we also uh, continue adding uh, new KT KTX extensions to improve the Android APIs. Um, uh, to to uh, look at an example, um, this, is, uh, uh, this is the bitmap API. If you uh, want to create a bitmap, uh, you call this function. And this is the drawable API. To use them together, uh, uh, actually, to create a bitmap, you need to use them together. So uh, this is a, a code uh, which you need to write. You create your bounds object and uh, set the bounds uh, to your drawable. Uh, create a bitmap object, uh, draw the bitmap onto a ca canvas, and uh, add that to drawable. Uh, finally, set your bounds, and you will have your uh, uh, bitmap on the drawable. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, we uh, re uh, released an uh, extension function to do this job called to bitmap. So if you call to bitmap, uh, what uh, this extension function does is it actually consists the code which I mentioned before in the bottom. So each time uh, you only need to call uh, to bitmap function 
and we'll do the uh, we will run that code for you. So you don't need to run it anymore, which makes everything much simpler. Although everything is using uh, the same old APIs. Um, let's see what else. So other Kotlin specific APIs, uh, uh, Room and uh, Work Manager use coroutine APIs to make asynchronous uh, use cases much simpler. Also, paging tree is completely rewritten and uh, with Kotlin, including coroutines. Uh, Jetpack Compose, uh, probably you heard, heard of it, is a new UI toolkit for Android, and it's completely written in Kotlin. Uh, next to that, uh, we have docs, training, samples. So if you want to jump on the uh, modern Android train and learn uh, this new stuff uh, or this modern stuff. We have docs, samples, a lot of code labs. Uh, we also have courses. Uh, we previously released uh, courses on with Udacity. Uh, now we have a, a, a separate basic Android uh, Android with Kotlin course. Uh, next to it, we have uh, lots of articles and videos. For example, on Kotlin, we have Kotlin vocabulary series, and uh, uh, you can go out and check how uh, some specific keywords uh, work in Kotlin and still keep the compatibility with Java. Now let's move to a new topic, uh, tools and Android Studio. Um, if we again take a look at the timeline, um, in 2013, Android Studio is announced. And um, in 2016, uh, Constraint Layout Editor um, is released. And also, uh, the uh, ADT uh, Android developer tools for Eclipse is deprecated. Uh, in 2017, uh, Kotlin support is announced. Um, with that, uh, well, IntelliJ already uh, was working with Kotlin, and actually, you could use Android in uh, um, uh, you you could use Kotlin in Android too. But with proper support, we are basically not breaking stuff uh, with every release. Also, um, uh, in 2017, a bunch of uh, profilers is released for Android Studio, such as the CPU profiler, memory profiler, and network profiler. In, uh, in 2018, with uh, 3.1, uh, D8 is added. Uh, and later, we uh, released two new profilers, Energy and Systrace. Uh, in 2019, uh, Navigation Editor is released. And 2020, we have View Binding Motion Editor. Meanwhile, uh, let's see uh, what else the tools have added. So um, IntelliJ has a very powerful code refactoring and uh, it has extensible UI uh, uh, for future tools, which we can make things more consistent. Also, the core uh, IDE plugins, as well as the uh, pl uh, additional plugins for Android, is being actively developed uh, by us and uh, JetBrains. So we have more control on uh, the platform API, uh, the core uh, IDE APIs, and uh, we can build things easier. Uh, so there's a, uh, a better um, um, uh, work with uh, between uh, JetBrains and Google to provide better developer tools support. Also, there is a tighter integration with Kotlin and Gradle with the tools. Uh, not to mention lint checks, quick fixes, and most importantly, uh, integration with existing and new APIs. Uh, such as navigation, layout, data binding, and room. Um, and we take a look at the, uh, when we take a look at the modern APIs as the third pillar, uh, uh, the main thing is Android Jetpack, or let's say part of Android Jetpack. Uh, so in 2017, Constraint Layout uh, is released, uh, which is followed with architectural components, uh, which consists Life cycles, view model, and room. 
Uh, in 2018 at Google I.O., we announced paging, navigation, and work manager, uh, which is followed with material design components to help you build beautiful apps. Uh, in 2019, uh, uh, Camera X is uh, um, released and Jetpack Compose is announced. And in 2020, we have Motion Layout and Motion Editor. So let's take a look at those uh, in a bit more detail. First, the constraint layouts. Uh, if you never used constraint layout before, it's basically relative uh, layout on st steroids. Uh, so um, constraint layout can help you build rich UI uh, with interrelations between different uh, UI uh, views and uh, or their parents uh, by uh, creating constraints between them. So the UI can uh, size itself and position the elements automatically. Um, next, we have motion layout and motion editor, which helps you build animations very easy. You, basically, you create a start and end frame, and uh, the tool will figure out what needs to be in between. And of course, uh, uh, you can uh, tweak that and create your uh, motion, uh, your custom motion. Um, if you never tried that before, there is a very, very good code lab on this, and I strongly suggest taking a look at it uh, because motion layout is amazing. Um, I talked about how um, complicated uh, the life cycle life cycles were. Uh, this is a graph for activity life cycle, and if you actually add the fragment life cycle next to it things become even more complicated. So uh, if you previously uh, need to do anything like um, um, uh, start the GPS or um, uh, register a library to start working and later stop or resume, you need to do a lot of work. You need to follow what life cycle in your, uh, your activity or fragment is in. And According to that, uh, you need to act and uh, call appropriate methods, which was really um, not that easy. So with life cycles, basically the life cycle owner, um, there are life cycle owners, and uh, you can get the life cycle owner object and set an observer on it. For example, here we get the uh, life cycle of the uh, my activity and set my observer on it. Then you can write an observer, which can um, basically implement uh, the life cycle, uh, life cycles uh, they're interested in. For example, here we have the on start life cycle uh, annotated with on life cycle event. So each time my activity goes through on start, uh, my, uh, the start function on my observer will be called. So you will you can do what you need to do on, on start. Uh, this really helps writing uh, libraries which needs to um, uh, tie itself into uh, activity or fragment life cycles because they can just create their own observer and uh, register uh, your life cycle on their observer. Uh, view model uh, stores uh, live data objects, uh, so uh, you can observe live data, live data from your activities, fragments, or views. Uh, this really helps separating the data and UI from uh, each other and uh, work uh, in uh, different classes uh, without uh, polluting the UI with logic and data. So one, uh, the uh, UI observes the data, and if something has changed, uh, live data we model uh, tells the UI what has changed. And if you add room to uh, live data and view model, um, you'll uh, suddenly uh, be able to use database, again, with much less code. Um, uh, with that, the data layer uh, with, uh, 
uh, talks to room. And um, uh, for example, here you can query the database to return some elements or items, and they will be made available uh, through uh, the live data object in the view model uh, to user interface. If we take a look at how Room works, um, a simple uh, Room uh, DAO is simple as this. Uh, you basically add your annotations, and uh, Room will generate the uh, code with the proper uh, SQL syntax. Um, um, you can add your custom queries, such as uh, the, in the query, you can see uh, we are uh, selecting star from the donut table. Uh, you can add different parameters. Uh, you can change how it's ordered. But whatever you do with the uh, SQL, it will be compiled. So Room will tell you if your SQL statement is wrong. Um, so, uh, or um, you can also use the paging library, which uh, talks to Room and returns a page list of objects. Uh, that's also another uh, great addition. So, with uh, integration uh, of those together, uh, um, view model and live data, data is uh, lifecycle aware, uh, so they know uh, how to recover from a um, uh, configuration change event where your activity or fragment might be killed. Uh, they are bec uh, also, because they are lifecycle aware, uh, they can work uh, seamlessly with other lifecycle aware. Event, uh, uh, components they can uh, they they help you to avoid leaks and also uh, use observers to uh, interact with uh, UI uh, room uh, as I mentioned um, uh, uses uh, the view uh, view model and live data can use room as the uh, data layer uh, to access database and expose those data to UI. Uh, it separates data from the UI. Um, Room uh, uh, uses coroutines and flow, uh, which helps you to work uh, in a non-UI thread to access the database. And also, if you're a big Rx Java fan, uh, all those uh, architectural components are compatible with Java, uh, Rx Java, so uh, you can go ahead and use Rx Java with them. Um, new Android Studio also uh, has templates for uh, navigation, uh, built-in uh, navigation support. Uh, so basically, uh, um, uh, navigate, how navigation works is uh, there is a navigation editor which you can uh, uh, create your destinations and uh, their relations. Uh, basically, here we have one activity which consists of two fragments, and we are expecting both fragments uh, be able to navigate to each other. Basically, you can uh, create their actions, and uh, maybe uh, if they have any parameters, you can pass those. Uh, you can also declare how they pass that. And uh, what this tool actually does in the background is it creates an XML file. Uh, you can again see here uh, we have a first and second fragment with the proper actions going back to each other. So if you want to add a third fragment, you're free to use the navigation editor or jump into the XML and uh, write the XML code on your own as it's pretty much uh, readable. And once you have that, uh, the navigation has become something as simple as this. You ask for the navigation controller, and then the call the navigate uh, function with the uh, uh, navigation uh, parameter you want to uh, do, such as uh, more, uh, navigating from the first fragment to second fragment in this case. Um, navigation also supports um, passing arguments uh, between each other, uh, which is called save arts. Um, uh, with navigation, uh, we highly encourage you to use single activities 
uh, because uh, each uh, the how navigation works right now is a, a navigation graph is formed for uh, an activity, which means if you have multiple activities, uh, once uh, when you uh, navigate from one activity to other, you basically leave the navigation graph of the first activity and start a new navigation activity with the uh, second activity. So we, uh, that's why we encourage you to use single activities with multiple fragments with the navigation uh, component. Uh, navigation also supports proper consistent up versus back handling. Uh, you can easily change the uh, back stack. And uh, for example, if you don't want to go through the sign, in, uh, sign up process when the user hits back from the first screen, you can easily do that. So navigation uh, supports all those uh, in a very easy way. And also, uh, the, uh, probably the best is uh, navigation also supports on-demand uh, dynamic features, which will help you shrink your apps. And I'll talk about it later. Next, work manager. I'm running uh, uh, out of time, I guess. I have 13 minutes left. Oh, 23 minutes left. OK, I have time. Um, so work manager is for uh, uh, deferrable work. Uh, here, uh, uh, the timing is important, such as uh, if you want to do an upload or another uh, operation, which needs to be time-based. It's guaranteed to work in the background, um, and uh, it's persistent. So if your app restarts or crashes, uh, you're guaranteed that the work will be uh, will stay the same. And uh, Work Manager um, also uh, is uh, supports back to API level 14. Um, work Manager is smart enough to use Job Scheduler or Alarm Manager broadcast receiver when it's appropriate, uh, depending on uh, the, what uh, the current API level on the user uh, 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 is compatible with. Uh, you, uh, you can create periodic tasks, or uh, you can create parallel or chain tasks. Uh, and the best is you can uh, create constraint on, on those tasks, such as you may ask for an unmetered network or uh, 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 the user to plug in their phone to charger and so on. Let's uh, see an example and work on a use case. Uh, in this use case, we have um, a camera app, which basically uh, gets an image and applies several filters. And then uh, we do a compression. And finally, we upload the image uh, to our backend. Uh, you can see we can apply filters uh, um, all together, and uh, this is basically a sequ sequential event. And uh, we can add a constraint on this. For example, uh, adding a filter can consume a lot of battery. So if the battery is low, we, uh, we can skip this. And next step is only performed after the filter uh, part is done. Uh, the next task, uh, we compress the image. But again, uh, maybe we don't want to do this if the storage is not low. So we add uh, a constraint on this. Uh, next, we upload the image. And again, if we are traveling on rooming or maybe on a metered network, we don't want to do that. So again, we can add a constraint so that the user will not start uploading the image when uh, uh, they are outside on uh, 3G, 4G metered network. But when they are home in an unmetered network, uh, the upload can start. And let's see some code how this is done. Uh, first, um, you define your logic in workers. Uh, you create a new worker class and uh, override the do work function, which returns a success or failure as a result. And you add your um, uh, logic in this uh, function where you see the ping execute your business logic here command. And then um, you create um, um, 
you know, add your uh, you create your content here. We had uh, set requires battery not low uh, constraint and build it as a constraint. Then uh, we create a one-time worker uh, work request and add our uh, worker class, which we created in the first step with the constraints we created uh, just before and build this. Uh, this is the filter one work. Basically, it's a one-time work request, uh, which consists of the filter worker we created and has the constraints we added, uh, we created uh, the slide before. With that, we can create other filter requests. And finally, uh, we create a list of them and uh, tell work manager to begin with those and call NQ to start the work. Uh, if we want to add the other um, works we, we mentioned, such as the compress and upload, we create them uh, in a similar way. We add the constraints. And uh, instead of uh, calling in queue on the work manager, we can use the chain then method uh, to add the other work and then call in queue so that the work manager can start working with this. Um, uh, the uh, work manager also supports foreground services, uh, so you can um, uh, use this. However, uh, make sure you use this sparingly when you only need it, because uh, this will keep the system alive and uh, it will definitely have some battery implications. So let's move to Camera X. Uh, Camera X uh, currently works with 94% of Android devices, uh, which are above API level 21. It is consistent, uh, it creates consistent output across all devices, and it's easier to use for developers. Um, Basically, there are uh, uh, three main use cases. Um, uh, first, uh, preview allows the app to have uh, a viewfinder uh, that shows the live camera feed. Uh, next, the image analysis gives you um, the access to camera frames. Uh, you can get the bytes. Um, you can run your algorithm to do filters or other stuff and enable uh, features like um, object detection or augmented reality. And the third use case is capture, which simply allows you to take a picture and save it to the device. Uh, to use Camera X, uh, let's see some code. Uh, first, uh, first step, uh, you create and configure an image capture object. Um, you need to provide a config, uh, and in this config, you can specify uh, parameters such as the resolution you're expecting from the picture. Um, if you have done uh, development with camera before, um, these parameters not uh, doesn't work with all devices all the time. Uh, this is where Camera X comes to help. Uh, Camera X handles uh, this device uh, device diversity for you. Uh, for example, here we are asking for uh, 600 to 800. But what if the device you are running uh, this code on doesn't support this resolution? In that case, Camera X will figure out something as close as uh, to this resolution and give you that. So uh, Camera X can really help you to uh, keep your use cases uh, easy and simple to implement. Step two, uh, we have binding. Uh, uh, you know, there are different life cycles in an, uh, an Android camera app. Um, um, so with the binding, uh, the use case, uh, uh, we are binding the use case to a uh, life cycle owner. Uh, so Camera X will take control of all life cycles, and you don't need to manage the uh, states on your own. Uh, when the camera is open, uh, the camera is open when it's needed and uh, released when uh, you're done with the camera. 
so with that, in step three, uh, basically we ask to call the picture, uh, which snaps, and uh, then we can uh, have the picture to uh, use in our use case. So basically, with three lines of code, uh, you can uh, write uh, this code to uh, call the camera, uh, uh, set your preferences, such as the resolution, and uh, take the picture and continue with your work. With that, uh, we are coming to the end of the API section. Um, um, we do releases very frequently. Uh, I believe the Jetpack re releases are uh, every two weeks. And uh, new APIs are always in development, such as Jetpack Compose, Yield, Paging Tree. And with that, let's move to distribution, um, which uh, we have Android app bundles. So again, if you look at the timeline, Android app bundles uh, are launched in 2018 in Google I.O. And if we take a look at why we need this, um, it's very easy to uh, get a, a low memory device because uh, you can easily upgrade the screen size or other functionality and cut down from the uh, uh, storage space, uh, which is uh, which can have some other uh, side effects like uh, running uh, low in internal free space. And actually, three out of ten homes have less than one gigabyte of storage uh, on the device. So storage uh, constraint users uh, uh, uninst will uninstall your app, uh, which will um, which will basically uh, means your users will leave your app, and there's no guarantee that they will reinstall the app again. Um, with app app bundles. Um, 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 also, uh, 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 forgot to mention the APK size is another uh, huge factor on the install success rate. Uh, the smaller the API uh, APK size uh, becomes, the, hard, uh, the uh, bigger chance your app will be downloaded and installed. Uh, imagine uh, you need to do some task, and uh, in Play Store you see two apps which does the same exact thing but one is uh, three, uh, three times larger than the other one, and you're in a meter network. There's not much question that uh, you will download the smaller app. So with, uh, uh, with that, uh, smaller downloads means increased uh, installations. And with app bundles, uh, uh, you can easily achieve this. Uh, so if we take a look at how this works, in a legacy APK, we basically put everything inside uh, in one APK. And when the user downloads it, uh, they basically download every language, every um, different configuration, and also every part of the app, which they may not be using. Um, with the app bundles, uh, the user will basically only download the parts of the app which they will need. Uh, in this case, they will have the 6 to 4-bit ARM with the proper uh, resolution they will need with the language they will use on the phone, not everything uh, uh, which they will not use. Uh, so app on, another way uh, to visualize this uh, configuration is like uh, this. Uh, you can have. Uh, one device which will need all three features where other devices will have uh, different needs for different features. Let me speed up a bit. Uh, so with app bundles, um, uh, if you take a look at some uh, numbers on app bundles, right now we have uh, over 500K apps in production. Um, it's 35% uh, uh, of active installs, and uh, it's nearly used 50% uh, of the top apps and games in App Store. 
and uh, in um, average, um, the download size uh, is shrink down to 20% with app bundles. So with that, let's pull everything together. On the language pillar, we talked about Kotlin. Then we switched to Android Studio. Uh, we talked about architectural components, constraint layouts, motion layout, camera X, and um, material design components for APIs. And with distribution, we talked about app bundles. Uh, if you're curious about any of those topics or didn't understand my English or didn't like how I uh, talked about it, you can go out and check out this link where you can find more information on each topic. And with that, um, I can spend some qu uh, time on uh, answering questions. Let me switch to... All right. Um, I am looking at the chat. Uh, if the organizers can help me uh, finding out questions, which I might be missing because I have I don't uh, I don't know any uh, Arabic. <laughs> I guess we don't have any questions right now, but maybe we'll have some. Okay, we are waiting for questions. Or maybe this means everyone understood everything and we're done. Thank you. Okay, in this case, um, thank you very much. I really enjoyed uh, talking about modern Android in such a a uh, nice um, environment and uh, audience. Hopefully next time we'll get over this pandemic and I can be there in person to talk about something on Android. Thanks. <laughs>